and I will present you. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our um, uh, weekly seminar series at the Department of Marine Geosciences. We are honored to uh, host uh, Dr. André, uh, André Pellerin from the University of uh, Quebec in Rimouski, Canada. Um, he is going to talk about the uh, iron sulfur cycle and early diagenesis in the Bornholm Basin in the Baltic Sea. A little bit uh, about uh, André. André Pellerin received his PhD in Earth and Planetary Science from McGill University. He completed his first postdoc at Aarhus University in Denmark with the world expert on biogeochemical bio processes in the seabed. Dr. Pellerin organized scientific cruises, becoming uh, adept at uh, successfully coring, sampling of the seal floor. He developed approaches to model biogeochemical processes in marine sediments as well. He uses both skills for his postdoc and the, at the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. So just recently, actually this year in 2021, André started a new position at the University of Quebec in Rimouski in Canada. Scientists are concerned that the sudden collapse of thawing soils in the Arctic could double the warming uh, results from the release of natural methane, a highly important greenhouse gas. Dr. Pellerin investigates the release of methane from the warning to warming tundra into the atmosphere and its consequences on the Earth's climate. He will travel to Alaska to measure methane, fluxes, and pour the sediments of thermocast lake, lakes formed from the melting of ground ice in a region underlain by permafrost. From these measurements and samples, he hopes to develop mathematical models to predict future methane flux. So, um, André, the podium is yours. Okay, great. Thanks a lot um, uh, for the introduction. Uh, maybe just one precision. Uh, per precision. I'm uh, just about to start uh, my job at the uh, University of Quebec at um, uh, But right now, I'm just finishing up the last little bits of my postdoc at uh, Ben Gurion University uh, with uh, Prof. Ritzivan. And uh, uh, thank you. So. Um, I'm going to talk today. I, I, talk, I, I talk with Nick a little bit about what exactly I should be giving as a as a talk. And despite that, my current work is working on methanogenesis in the Arctic. Um, uh, we thought that maybe something uh, that could be more relevant to the marine sciences uh, would be uh, this little story about uh, early diagenesis in the Born in the Bonhomme Basin. And uh, so I'll get to that uh, very quickly. Uh, this is uh, something that started a couple of years ago, but it's really a, a, a joint effort by a, a large number of people from many institutions. And uh, I have to give uh, a great amount of credit to Jerry Liu, who uh, did um, really took the data sets that we produced during these cruises and was able to up-level them to, a, to, 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 to something that was very interesting. So a lot of this is, uh, is uh, his primary work. Um, and so uh, I'll introduce just myself a little bit. What I do is I take uh, sediment and I do lab experiments. I measure stable isotopes and I use uh, stable isotope tracers to try to understand how microbes function and how to try to understand how the seafloor processes happen. Um, that's what I do in general. And today we're going to talk really about the last little bits or the bottom parts of the sulfur cycle. So really how pyrite is formed, how sulfate reduction produces sulfide and that sulfide can actually be buried. And how, what that can tell us about what really is happening in the water column and what's happening in the atmosphere and how, it can, how it's recorded. Um, and so sulfate reduction really is an important process. Uh, it's really an important process and it's an important process in the Bonhomme Basin as well as uh, worldwide. It buries a lot, it remineralizes a lot of the organic matter that's, that hits the sea floor. And it's a sink for sulfur, which otherwise wouldn't be there. And 
Its in intensity varies considerably throughout the oceans, but it's mostly important in continental, on the continental shelves where you have this higher flux of organic matter. And so, um, and, and that will influence how, where there is a sink of sulfur. <clears throat> so, uh, um, first, to understand everything, I need to cover a little bit about the uh, sulfate, about sulfate reduction and the implications of that. So sulfate reduction basically is just the um, organic matter is reoxidized to CO2 and uh, using a sulfate as an electron acceptor, um, producing sulfide. And doing this, the bacteria that live in the seafloor and basically anywhere where it's anoxic, um, can get energy to grow, reproduce, and uh, and synthesize uh, and synthesize themselves. Uh, and so this is widespread; it's everywhere on Earth. But the reaction rate, if we look at the reaction rate as the sulfate goes through this metabolism, the reaction rate of the light sulfur, the sulfur that's iso the 32 sulfur, so the light isotope of sulfur, is a little bit faster than the reaction rate of the 34 isotope, of the heavy isotope of, of, of sulfur. And so that creates an isotopic fractionation such that the sulfide that's produced is a little bit lighter, isotopically speaking, than the sulfate from which it, it started. And that's basically the crux of everything that we're gonna talk about today. It's, this is the thing that's driving all of this, all of, what, all of the things that we're, we're understanding. And if we go back, uh, billions of years through the uh, throughout Earth's history, we see that in sedimentary rocks there are isotopic there are isotopic differences between the measurements of the sulfides. If we are if the left side here is uh, is a long long time ago and we go right towards today here, we see that there is a distinct distribution of the isotopes of sulfate uh, of sulfide throughout the pyrite and throughout the sulfate proxies. And that difference uh, definitely scatters through, uh, it, there's a large scatter in them. And what we're trying to do basically in, by investigating modern marine sediments is to understand how the, the, the environments under which this was deposited. And so, and when we're talking about the Delta 34S, we mean when we go to heavier or more positive values, it means that we're enriched in 34, and if we go to negative values, then we're depleted in 34 in the heavy isotope relative to a standard. And this is going to go, uh, come uh, throughout again in this. But OK, so now we have, we know that there's lots of isotopes. Uh, there's a distribution of safe isotopes throughout the rock record in marine sediments. But what are they useful for? Well. First and foremost, it's a marker for microbial metabolism. If you have fractionations in the seafloor, you have a presence of a microbial metabolism, whereas you wouldn't otherwise. Uh, but it's, it can also be used to retrace environmental conditions because the environment uh, limits the metabolism and in turn that affects the isotopic fractionation. And so we can learn more about what the environment, um, about the environment. And so there, it's been quite, uh, quite a, a widespread use of sulfur isotopes to really understand uh, uh, the Earth's evolution and uh, how the water column, uh, if, if the, the redox state of the water column. And there's been many studies done on this. And it's been used to understand if there was a sulfitic, euxinic conditions, ferruginous conditions. So if there was sulfide in the water column, iron in the water column, and where it was. Um, so we can reconstruct ocean chemistry using the isotopic signature that's found in the pyrites. But the question that keeps coming up and that we never really get away from when we're trying to understand the past is like, do the pyrites that are formed and that we measure in the sediments, do they represent the primary signature of something that happened in the water column? Or is it something that happened after, afterwards? And so in understanding this, the depositional context is really important. Uh, uh, Oh, sorry, there's, there's a pop-up here that says, should I admit 
Okay, I'm just gonna admit people here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think that that was uh, that was okay. Can you guys hear me? Can anybody hear me? We can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Uh, wait, wait, hold on. Hold on one second. Uh, John or Nico, uh, will you take care of if people come in to let them in? So. Yes, but I'm trying to do it. Um, well, we can hear him. It's okay. Oh, okay, I can do it. Also, I just I, I just didn't expect. No, no, no. no. You shouldn't have to. Don't. You shouldn't have to pay attention to it at all. <laughs> just ignore it. Ignore okay. it. Someone else okay. will let them in. Okay, I'll just keep talking then. Yeah, yeah. You just keep talking. Ignore all right. Those. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, great. So um, the depositional context is important. So meaning that like the interplay between iron and sulfur during early diagenesis, what happens and then how it determines the strength of the sulfur sink and the spatial and depositional variables control the resulting isotopic ratio preserved in pyrite. So that's kind of a summary. Um, and so, right. And so this depositional context is important. And so now we're going to take this little microbial, this microbial cell, this, this sulfate reducing cell that we talked about a bit previously, and let's put it in sediments. And in, in sediments, we have what we know as the, like this, the redox stratification, this redox ladder, where the first thing that's used is the thing that gives the most energy. So we know that like, the first thing that when a particle of organic matter hits the seafloor, well, first, it's going to be preferably using oxygen. And only once the oxygen is depleted, you get nitrate reduction and it uses nitrate. And then you get to go through this cascade of different electron acceptors until you actually hit this sulfate that we're going to talk about. And so the electron acceptors are stratified with respect to how much energy they yield. And sulfate reduction is actually down this ladder quite a bit. And so and so the quality of the organic, organic matter that it, that, it, that it has access to is actually not that very high. It's something that's all the good parts have already been eaten. And you have sulfate reduction, uh, which is consuming the sulfate. It's producing sulfide. And so you get this peak of sulfide in the sediment. And then you have methane that's coming up from methanogenesis lower down. And this is what is feeding also the anaerobic oxidation of methane. And so, that concept is important. It's not sulfate reduction isn't something that's consuming this really high organic rich matter. It's consuming the waste products or, or what's left. And so when we're talking about it in terms of the fractionation, uh, what we are increasingly finding is that, well, the fractionation, so this is epsilon, it's the difference between sulfide and sulfate, isotopically speaking, it's really, it's really high in marine sediment, in most marine sediments it's high, close to 70, 60 to 70 per mil, uh, because the cell specific sulfate reduction rates of marine sediments. So the amount at the rate at which they're eating is limited by the amount of organic matter that's available. It's not limited by sulfate, it's not limited by other things. And what we see is that, well, in marine sediments, uh, the cell specific sulfate reduction rates are always a lot lower than what we're seeing, or almost always a lot lower than what we're seeing in pure cultures the pure cultures are here. And it means that the fractionations are high. They are close to the thermodynamic equilibrium. So that means around 70 per mil. And so, um, and so that's an important concept to understand that or sulfate reduction in marine sediments, at least the ones I'm gonna talk about today are always producing these very large sulfur isotope fractionation associated with sulfate reduction. And uh, I mean, I'll just go, just to go over these graphs as well here. This is the rate at which we measure pure cultures. And then this is the rate at which we're seeing in the environment as we go down with depth. And so we're even in the surface, we're very much at a very high, uh, a very low rates of sulfate reduction compared to what we're studying. <clears throat> and so what does this mean for the isotopic rock record, what we're trying to see here? So we're seeing these very large diversity if what I was saying was right in the previous slide that the, there's about a 60 to 70 per mil. Well, we should see the sulfates around pooling around this line and we should see the sulfides around 60 per mil lower. This is clearly not what the, what the case is. And so this, uh, this, this variations can be, ex this variation in the pyrite minerals that we're seeing with time, we can uh, interpret them as something else. But what is that? Well, and then the, the fact is that, well, the sulfate reduction is just this first little bit of this arrow. 
and then there's a large amount of reoxidation and there's a lot of stuff going on in the seafloor uh, before the final signature that we can actually preserve on geological time scale uh, is, is, is uh, preserved. And so most of the sulfide is actually reoxidized to sulfate. You don't have really time to go into what that means and, and how that uh, how that pans out. But um, uh, yeah. And so if I can go, continue here, I'm going to talk with about organoclastic sulfate reduction and the sulfate driven anaerobic oxidation of methane and their role in pyrite formation. And uh, notice that I put the OSR, the organic classic sulfate reduction in the top and the sulfate driven uh, um, or AOM at the, at the bottom. And that's because, and so, so sulfate reduction primarily happens, OSR probably happens in the surface of sediments, whereas AOM happens from the bottom up. And both reactions produce sulfide that sulfide react, can react with iron oxides to produce elements of sulfur, which can be disproportionated, which so this element of sulfur can then go on and then reproduce sulfide and sulfate. But that sulfide reacts also with iron too to produce iron monosulfides. And that iron monosulfide can react with sulfides or polysulfides to produce the pyrite that we want, the, 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 pyrite, the pyrite that's uh, sequestered. And so both reactions will produce pyrite, except that one comes from the is happening at the surface sediments, where or mostly at the surface sediments, whereas the other is happening mostly uh, lower down in the place where sulfate is being depleted. And uh, throughout the talk, uh, iron monosulfides are called AVS, for acid volatile sulfides, and CRS are called chromium reduce or CRS. Or pyrite is CRS for chromium reducible sulfides. Those are just operational definitions that are slightly different from the real terms. And so now let's look at this. We've got OSR happening in the surface. We've got sulfate AOM or anaerobic oxidation of methane happening at the bottom. And so both of them are producing sulfide and both of them are contributing to a change in isopic, isopic fractionation. Sulfate gets depleted with depth and uh, as it's being depleted, the resulting, because we are taking some of the light isotopes out of the sulfate pool, we're producing these light sulfides. And so the sulfate becomes more and more enriched with depth as we go towards the AOM, towards the sulfate methane transition. And the sulfide, because of mass balance effects, the sulfide starts out quite, uh, quite light and then progressively becomes more heavy because the sulfate from which it's produced is uh, becoming heavier and heavier. And uh, okay, that's okay. But then, so that's the sulfate, sorry. So that's the sulfate and the sulfide, what's happening in, uh, in the sulfate and sulfide pool, uh, sorry, the sulfate and the sulfide pools, yeah. And then we're interested in pyrite. And so pyrite itself, its formation is limited by the supply of organic matter that's going to limit uh, AO, um, sulfate uh, reduction. It's going to be limited obviously by sulfate. So if there's no sulfate, you can't have any sulfide formation, so you can have pyrite. But it's also uh, controlled by the re um, availability of reactive iron minerals. So in the Baltic Sea, which we're gonna talk about, sediments uh, uh, produce an excess of sulfide. And so it's actually the sulf the iron concentration, which is going to control the amount of pyrite formation and, the, and, and also the isotopic signature. Um, with the delta 34S of the pyrite is a function of the delta 34S of the sulfide and the depth where it precipitates. Because the sulfide is actually evolving over time, depending on where the pyrite is precipitating, you're going to inherit a different isotopic value for this pyrite. Okay, so good. So now I covered some, some uh, concepts here. So now let's look at a real basin. Let's look at a real basin. And now let me go back, or maybe I'll take you guys from Israel down here, and then we're gonna go up to the Baltic Sea here. In the Baltic Sea, uh, uh, right there. I think most of you are quite probably familiar with the Baltic Sea. The history of the Baltic Sea is, uh, well, the, during the last glacial uh, 
uh, glacial period, it was uh, uh, an ice sheet. It was under an ice sheet. And uh, uh, over time, well, the, the glacier receded and they deposited some sand and some gravel at the bottom. And that, after that, formed it formed a lake, a freshwater lake, which we call the Ancillus Lake, which uh, came around for a couple thousand years. And then the Litorina Sea, eventually there was a connection with the Atlantic Ocean, and then the body became marine, uh, marine, uh, marine conditions. And the star here is what we're going to talk about here. This is our study site. But this is the uh, story. Um, and so now that we learned a little bit about all the different microbiogeochemical processes, let's look at the controls on organic matter degradation in the Baltic Sea. So we're going to talk about sulfate reduction, about methanogenesis here. But here, this is a, this is the, a, a basin in the, uh, in the Baltic Sea. We see sand and glacial till, and then under, uh, overlain here by this a Holocene mud layer. So this is the stuff that formed after the glaciers. Uh, glaciers retreated, and you see that this, uh, the basin is relatively uh, homogeneous. It's uh, except that the uh, sediment thickness is varying, uh, is varying, and you can see that uh, uh, there are different sedimentation rates here. In general, the organic matter type and the, the organic matter content, and then the the amount of iron that's coming into the basin everything is relatively equal. So there's not a big variation in TUC or other things. It's just the sedimentation rate that is different. And so if you core along, if you produce a number of cores along a transect in the Baltic Sea, oh, I should probably point out here that the reflectors here are just because there is methane that is accumulating here. And so you can't see any, any further than the methane bubbles. And um, if you core throughout this, we can see that there's a very strong relationship between the depth of the Holocene mud layer, so the, the Holocene mud here, and the depth of the sulfate methane transition. And this is an important concept I need to understand, uh, need you guys to understand. If you look at the sulfate profiles, you see that the depth or the penetration depth of the sulfate is going to be related to the depth of the Holocene mud layer. Um, and that's simply because as you go deeper, you can have uh, sulfate gets depleted more and uh, you have production of methane. Once you have production of the methane, methane migrates upwards and reacts at the depth of the sulfate methane transition zone. So it pushes up. If you have more methane, it's pushing up the sulfate methane transition zone to a higher and higher level. And so it's completely dependent on the depth of the Holocene mud layer. Your sulfate profile is dependent on the depth of the Holocene mud layer. And like, if I can, uh, I want to highlight this, that it's not the sulfate reduction rates that determine the depth of the sulfate methane transition. If you take a profile until you hit the sulfate methane transition, if you take a profile of the sulfate reduction rate at any one of those, uh, of those, of those sites, you get the same sulfate reduction rate. So the amount of sulfate that's being reduced to sulfide is going to overlap each other. If you look at this here, until you hit, these are three sites with very different sulfate methane transition zone, but you'll look at the surface and you'll have trouble being able to see a difference between the sulfate reduction rates until you hit the depth of sulfate depletion. This is a case for a study that we did a few years ago. Um, also in, the, in, in other studies, if you put them on the age versus sulfate reduction rate, um, you are not going to be able to differentiate the sulfate reduction rates between the different sites in the Baltic Sea. Even though there are differences in the sedimentation rate, um, they are basically canceled by the oxygen and the nitrate reduction. And so once you hit the sulfate reducing zone, it's basically the same profiles that are, that are happening. And it's basically because the nature of how organic matter degrades in the Baltic Sea it makes the depth of the sulfate methane transition very sensitive to sediment thickness. There's this rate law. If you look at the rate of degradation of organic matter, uh, 
over the age of the organic matter, you see that everything falls on a very straight line. This is a, a concepts that have been known for a very long time. And if you look at the sulfate reduction rates here, the sulfate reduction rates are constant, but they drop until you hit the sulfate methane transition, and then they drop very quickly afterwards. But then the methanogenesis rates more than make up for this, such that it's the degradation of organic matter if you sum the sulfate reduction rate plus the methanogenesis measurements, you get a relatively linear profile. And that's just related to how organic matter is degrading in the sediments. Okay, so now uh, let's focus in a little bit more on the Baltic Sea and Bo uh, on the Bonhomme Basin. And uh, in the Bonhomme Basin, it archives a glacial, interglacial and post-marine uh, 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 glacial marine transgression. And there's a, a there's spatial variation in sedimentation rate across this transect that we did from sites BBO7 up to BBO3. There's also a site here that was off transect. Uh, but the TOC and sediment characteristics, characteristics are otherwise really similar across the sampling area. It's just sedimentation rate that is, uh, that is varying. And so now I'm going to go back and here is a seismic of the of the, of the transect that we did. And uh, here you can see that, well, very similar to the other graph that I showed you, there's differences in the sedimentation rates throughout the basin. And as you increase the sedimentation rate, well, at some point you increase it too much that the gas or the methane is right at the surface offering a reflex, so we can't really see it there. But this is a great place to explore the interplay between iron, sulfur, and methane and what happens on to the sulfur isobic signatures of the, of the pyrite that's produced. Uh, so similarly to the other picture, picture that I showed uh, to you guys, um, uh, we can see that the sulfate profiles, so the sulfate concentration profiles, uh, will vary with where uh, we are in the basin from something that goes without a sulfate methane, where you have no sulfate depletion, or here, you just start to see the beginnings of a sulfate methane transition. And here you can just have a little bit of methane that's being produced. And then as you go to higher sedimentation rates, you're gonna hit a shallower and shallower sulfate methane transition. And I keep push, pushing a, a, against this because this is the primary, this is gonna be the first control on what's happening in, uh, in, in the sediments with the pyrite formation. So we got sulfate being depleted er, shallow, uh, to a shallower depth and more and more methane uh, as a result of the geological, uh, uh, of the, depo of the uh, deposition rate. So if we look now, if we look beyond the sulfate concentration profiles here and we look at these two sites, BBO8 and BBO6, they are very different in terms of how much their sulfate is uh, depleted. And, oh, uh, oh, uh, huh. Just a second. Okay, sorry. Yeah. All right. Perfect. And then the key questions are, well, again, we're talking about what is the interplay between the iron and sulfur during early diagenesis? What is the strength of the iron sulfur cycle and what controls it? And what are the predominant controls on the resulting isotopic ratio of the pyrite? So now let's look at these two sites here, BBO8 and BBO6. And um, Again, I'm just going to remind you guys of this. How does the thickness of sediment influence the pyrite formation in the surface? Well, it's primarily controlled by the amount of iron. You can have, if you have lots of uh, iron limitation, you're going to produce something that looks like the surface. And as you have more and more iron availability, you're going to look at something that's more and more uh, deeper, uh, that represents something that's uh, uh, from deeper in the, in the sediments. And so, Let's look now at the surface sediments, the top few centimeters at BBO8 and BBO6. If we look here and now we look at the scale here, this is depth in centimeters and you can see that you have no iron because you have sulfide around. And when you have no sulfide around, uh, sorry, when iron, no iron, you have the sulfide and sulfide is slowly diffusing down to the surface. This is BBO8, where you have a thick layer of sediment. So uh, the Holocene mud layer is very thick. You have a very high flux of sulfide into the first, uh, the first three centimeters. If you compare this to PP BBO6, well, you have a much, uh, a much lower flux of sulfide into the, uh, into the upper layers. And so uh, 
how does sediment thickness influence pyrite formation in the surface? That's the question, because we're looking at the surface now. Well, we can calculate these fluxes, uh, sorry, these fluxes here, 380 uh, nanomoles per uh, square centimeter per day or 44. So there's a very large difference in these fluxes. And then if we can do this for all of the different stations and we can, so we calculate the net sulfide production rate and the next flux of sulfide to the surface. And you can see that they're basically the same, meaning that most of it is actually making it to the surface. We can calculate this flux. And then with this flux here, um, we can, there's a strong relationship between the flux of sulfide to the surface sediment and the delta 34S of the sediment. So now again, we're still back to BBO8. We have this uh, sulfide flux. We have the sulfide flux from, uh, from, oh, from BBO5, and then we can see that, well, the delta 34S of the sulfide in the surface is very different. It's close to negative 40 in this site with, uh, with the low sedimentation rate, and it's higher as, uh, as you have the higher flux of sulfide. And so, and so uh, the delta 34S is determined by a combination of the sulfur fractionation by sulfur reduction at that depth and the delta 34S of the sulfide that's diffusing upwards. This is what you can see here. So, uh, yeah. Okay, and so what we're seeing is that, well, the Holocene mud layer thickness is controlled by the depth of the SMT. This varies the sulfide flux to the surface of sediment and in a combination of the H2S flux to the surface, so whatever is coming up from below and the sulfate reduction rate at that depth is controlling what the delta 34S of the sulfide is going to be. So the delta 34S of, this, of the pyrite obviously uh, inherits the delta 34S of those combined pools of sulfide and that is controlled by the Holocene mud layer thickness. And in this, in this uh, article here that we, in this uh, graph here that uh, we are that's currently under review, we see that, well, the H2, uh, the, the Holocene mud layer thickness is directly correlated with the flux of the sulfide to the surface. So we can see this relationship as we go from, uh, from, uh, from low sedimentation rates to high sedimentation rates here. And the H2S flux to the surface is also related to the difference between the delta 34S of the sulfate and that of the sulfide. So, uh, and then, and this is true for the Bonhomme Basin, but it also plots for a number of other different uh, uh, other uh, marine sediments. And so it's a very strong relationship. And of course, that also plays out to the Delta 34S of the pyrite. As you increase the flux of sulfide to the, to the surface, you decrease the isotopic fractionation or the Delta, sorry, you decrease the Delta 34S of the pyrite. And that seems to remain true for a large number of uh, different basins, not just uh, the Bonhomme Basin. Okay. <clears throat> What's going on? Sorry, I just have trouble switching slides. Okay. Uh, and so, okay, so this is all nice and well to, to say, but to model co this correctly, uh, we need to take into account the upwards diffusion of H2S and to take into account that it's enriched in 34S relative to the pore water H2S. So um, similar to how um, this, con the, this concept is true for sulfate reduction uh, and also for sulfide, uh, sulfide diffusion, diffusion up in the sediment. So as sulfate diffuses in the sediment, it's a, not a very intu it's not it's counterintuitive to think about, but the but there's a higher gradient for the 32 than for the 34. And similarly, as sulfide is diffusing away from the source of sulfide, there's a stronger gradient for the 32, sorry, for the 34 than the 32, meaning that the isopic signature of the sulfide that is diffusing upwards is heavier than the isopic signature that you can measure in at a given depth. So for example, the delta 34S of pore water H2S at three centimeters is negative 10 per mil, but the flux of H2S at that depth is, has a signature of plus one per mil. When we take 
the sulfate reduction rate, the microbial fractionations, and the H2S into account, we can see that we can correctly or pretty well predict the delta 34S of the H2S. Uh, uh, it correlates well with that which is observed. And uh, sim uh, yeah, and then this is if we vary the sulfate reduction rates, uh, if we take into account different values, uh, different fractionation values, we can predict well if we take into we can predict well what the delta 34S of the sulfide should be based on these parameters. So that was interesting to talk about. Okay, but that was the surface. So now we have this, we can understand how the surface delta 34S signature is being produced. And then what happens afterwards? Well, after that, the sediments get deeper and deeper and they get buried. And so what controls chloride formation at depth? And this is something that we tackled in the bottom basin, obviously. And this, uh, it was tackled at our, uh, most recent, um, in a recent paper that we talked about. And so now we had the surface sediment. Now we're talking about what happens deep, uh, deeper in the sediment. And what happens deeper in the sediment is that, um, well, we can very much see how the amount of pyrite or the amount of iron, sorry, that's available uh, will play a determining role into what's going to happen. So if we look at three sites here, BBO5, which has a low sedimentation rate, BBO2, which also has a relatively low sedimentation rate, and BBO3, which has a higher sedimentation rate, we can see that the amount of pyrite that's formed relative to the total amount of higher reactive iron um, is changing with depth. It turns out that there, in the surface, there's very little, and then it quickly becomes saturated, especially at the sites with the low sedimentation rate. It, it reaches 0 0.9 very quickly. And at 0 0.9, it stays stable, insinuating that there's no more iron available after you hit this 0 0.9 to be converted to a pyrite. At the lower sedimentation, as you go to, lower, uh, to higher sedimentation rate, well, there's more and more pyrite still available deeper in the sediments. And that will have a determining role for what the isophic signature of the pyrite is going to be. Um, and so, right, and so here we have the, the same graph here where we have the availability of iron. And here we have the delta 34S of the CRS at these three sites. And we can see that when you have severe iron limitation, what you seem to be inheriting is the isotopic signature in the surface. Whereas as you have um, more uh, I, uh, when, you have, when, you have, when you don't have any iron available anywhere here, you don't form any pyrite deeper. And so you inherited the surface signature. As you go to uh, moderate, moderate iron limitation or even higher uh, uh, or very little iron limitation, well, then you are, your delta 34S is going to inherit the signatures of the sulfides from deeper down in the, in the, in the sediment layer. And so these are effectively overprinting the isopic signatures that you inherited, that you got in the surface. And so <clears throat> these are just another ways to look at this relationship. You can see that the sedimentation rate is color coded here from low to high. And you can see that the Delta 34 S is very much related to whether it's uh, uh, to, to the amount of iron that's available. So under higher sedimentation rates, the contact time between the, sulf the pore waters, the sulfide and the pore waters, and the iron phases is low. And so that promotes a burial of reactive iron, which can then uh, uh, react uh, uh, later. And so under higher sedimentation rates, that uh, means that you have more reactive iron available at depth, and that promotes the formation of 34 enriched pyrite. And so, we, um, those are for the isotopic signatures of pyrite. And so what does this mean in the, in the broader context? Well, it means that a lot of what we are, that in the, a lot of this, uh, uh, that what, what we continuously have to think about what the isotopic signature of the sulfide that we find in sediments mean. And do they mean that, is it, is it a primary signal or is it a late signal? It, uh, it, it, it depends. On, uh, on the sedimentary context. And they, here with just a little bit of 
changing the sedimentation rate, which is a very little thing to, to, to think. We just need to tweak a little bit of the sedimentation rate and we can produce a very large differences in the isobic signatures that are inherited. And they can be hard to decorticate that from um, uh, in a sedimentary context. And um, here is a, um, here is a, uh, this is a, on the right side here, this is the, the, the data from the, Balt, the Bonhomme Basin in Baltic Sea where we looked at the iron, iron speciation. And we can see that we have these um, canonical different, uh, different, uh, th uh, different areas in the graph where we should have oxic water column versus possibly anoxic water column, a euxinic water column, maybe it's eucinic water column, and then this ferruginous. We know that in the Baltic Sea, we've had an oxic water column and maybe put, potentially it uh, varies sometimes with the uh, uh, anoxic uh, uh, every, every year for a few months or something like this. Bec um, but uh, we certainly don't have any ferruginous uh, environments. And in the past, uh, previous studies have very much focused on trying to understand uh, water column by looking at iron speciation, speciation. And if in one study, in one core, we can get a large different one, different amounts of, uh, uh, we can, we can have a, we can reproduce all of these things basically with one core in a known environment. And so what does that mean for how we understand the proxies for the past? And so this is not a new thing that we're proposing. This is something that people have been hacking away at for a very, very long time, uh, not for, for, for some time now. And there are many uh, recent studies that have come out and very interesting that, that clearly show every strong uh, uh, local uh, or some, uh, very local, uh, uh, local signatures on the marine pyrite sulfur isotopes. So it's not, it does not necessarily reflect a global signature when you see changes in Delta 34S. They don't reflect changes in, they don't necessarily reflect changes in ocean chemistry. They may very well just have to do with um, how uh, these sediments, uh, uh, local sedimentary processes. If I can just take one example from, from this paper that just came out this year from, uh, from uh, Virgil Pasquier and Itai Halevi, they clearly show this very strong relationship between uh, glacial interglacials and the delta 34s of the sulfide in shallower onshore sediments. So you see that the um, which which they which they interpret as being caused by changes in the uh, water level and so sedimentation rate. And you see these large peaks that correlate with the delta 18 of the of the Delta, the Delta, the Delta O18 in four amps. But when you go offshore, well, the water depth wasn't affected as much. And you can clearly see that this uh, has, over the same time scale, has very little changes in the sulfur isotopic signatures. And so, and so maybe I want to leave it to, to, uh, to somebody that said it already before, but Frequently, the delta 34 s of data are used to make direct reconstructions of ocean chemistry. However, we basically, it's increasingly obvious that sedimentary environments and the deposition have a dramatic impacts on the abundance and isotopic composition of both sulfate and sulfide data. And so in summary for what we, what I talked about is that basically the surface sediments, there's a strong correlation between the um, flux of H2S to the surface and the delta 34S of the pyrite that's inherited. Uh, then this is overprinted by uh, the by sedimentation rate uh, even more because um, you have less depletion of pyrite at depth. And that means that to understand the sulfur cycle, to understand ocean chemistry, and to understand the past environments, we really need to take into consideration the depos depositional environment and depositional processes. And then it's really by looking at these modern environment formations and how it's actively forming now that we can better understand uh, how they were formed in the past. Uh, perspective, uh, just very quickly now, I'm looking at, uh, I have been, the work was done at Oaks University. I came to Ben Gurion University for a postdoc and now I'm starting a new job at uh, 
Uka Ismar, where I hope to basically take these lessons and the study of these modern marine sediments to try to better understand uh, subsea permafrost and the processes that have that influence carbon cycling uh, in Arctic marine settings. Thanks. Thank, oh, thank you very much, Andre, uh, for a very interesting uh, uh, talk. Um, does anyone have questions? Yes. yes. Hello. I, I, I don't see most of you or the screen, so if so, if someone just ask if if someone wants to ask. Can you put the participants back in the screen? Uh, can I put the 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 what? Sorry. I I um, could you repeat? I, I didn't understand what what you want more. Oh, I see the participants. Oh, you see the participants? Oh, you see my actual screen? Oh, yes. you mean you mean this? Oh, all right. Never mind. <laughs> uh, um, do, do you see the correct screen? We see the screen uh, titled summary. Yeah, that's uh, is that is that right? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, Henry Schwartz, is this you asking the question? Sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Oh, I, I have a question. Uh, yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> in some of these environments, we know that you have a euxinic uh, basin in which, uh, as we understand, the sulfide is being partly formed as uh, particles which are deposited, which are actually forming in the water column, not yep. being formed in the sediment column. Uh, and how do you distinguish the effect of that in a real sedimentary environment? Right. Um, those are uh, yes. This is a. This is a. Yeah. This is com This is more uh, complex. Um, yes, there are some places where you have a actual formation of pyrite in the water column, right? And so those are, those are th those are primary uh, signatures, um, which. Could then be overprinted by anything that happens in the in the uh, in the uh, sediment um, in the Baltic Sea itself. This is not something that uh, that happens um, in terms of uh, mineralogy. We haven't done any uh, any type of uh, of uh, differentiation or trying to see the different crystalline structures and and uh, for pyrite uh, in in this study itself. Um, of, because we didn't think there was any formation in the in the surface, but uh, but it could be something that could be done in another place where you have a uh, sedimentary setting uh, where you think that this could be ha this this might be happening. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Am I missing someone? Please don't hesitate to ask without having my permission. Can I ask another question? Yes, yeah, sure. All right. Uh, most of the iron which is delivered in sedimentary particles is, is of course, is in the form of uh, iron which is trapped in the six fold sites inside of crystal lattices. For this to get out and to be available to be reacted with sulfide. It, the, the crystal lattice must be broken down. And this usually happens through oxidation of the, um, uh, well, let's say oxidation of the iron takes place during this breakdown, as we understand, which is why sediment becomes red when, when uh, iron particles break down on it. But in the environment that you're talking about, presumably the sulfur is able to react with particles with iron, which is still in a reduced state inside, it has still an Fe2 plus iron inside of crystal lattices in the sediment. Is that correct? Um, so uh, the way that we did the uh, uh, we did the sequential iron extractions. Maybe I can 
I can bring this up to the next, uh, I actually have it here. So the way that we did the, uh, the extractions is we did the um, sequential iron extractions, um, which uh, have different things. And so our highly reactive iron is basically, um, is it basically carbon associated. So like siderite, anchorite, we have the uh, iron oxides, so perihydrite, levidocrite. Um, we have a goetite, hematite, and akinite that we think we're getting, and, um, and then also magnetite. And so uh, other uh, reactive silicates or sheet silicates, we uh, are not getting them. Okay. Now, oh, that's good. So that's very interesting. But even uh, if you react hematite, it's necessary for there to be another reaction going on there which is a reduction of the three plus iron in the hematite crystal to two plus so that it can react with h 2 yes. So that's a coupled reaction which is going on simultaneously, which is also using up some of the electron capture that, that you have going on. Yes, yep. Okay, uh, last chance. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, Andre again, thank you very, very much. My pleasure. And uh, see you all uh, next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thanks. <laughs> thank you.